Devin Corin is a queer Appalachian, a recreational podcaster, an occasional drag king, and a highway enthusiast. Their first novel, Jack and the Dragon Man's Daughter, was featured at the 2019 Authors Day here in Knoxville. They live in the hills of Coryton with their two youngest daughters and their husband. Devin, we welcome you to the night tonight to the Knoxville Writers Guild, and the floor is now yours to teach us all things Nano Remo. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I am excited to to be here, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share a little bit about my journey. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen as well. I do have, as I uh, was mentioned in the um, in the intro, I have two little ones <laughs> who may or may not come barging in here at any moment. Uh, so <laughs> just as a warning, if you hear anything, uh, it is probably them. <laughs> uh, so we'll go ahead and get started with how to get ready for NaNoWriMo. Um, and I'll share my story. A little bit about me, uh, Devin, Corinne, go by they, them, or she, her, either one is fine. Um, I am originally from Greene County uh, in a little town called Mossheim, Tennessee, which is one of those places where you got the, hey, welcome to Mossheim, and please come back, like, on the same sign. <laughs> if you just go past it, you'll miss it. Uh, there is literally, like, one post office and a whole bunch of country roads. So that was, uh, that was where I grew up and was the inspiration for a lot of what I wrote about in my book. Um, I came to Knoxville in 2004 to pursue my degree, my master's degree in creative writing at the University of Tennessee. And I just fell in love with the city. Absolutely loved it here. I decided that I was gonna make it my home. Of course, now I live out in Corrington. So still back out in the country a little bit. So that's good. Um, uh, and I've got three daughters. I've got a 21 year old that I mentioned whenever we were kind of chatting about, um, and I've got a six-year-old and a three-year-old, so a little bit of a, little bit of a uh, spacing there, I suppose, but yes, so that's a little bit about me. I um, am here to talk to you about my book and how I came to write it, so uh, I have pa published exactly one novel, and that is the novel Jack and the Dragon Man's Daughter, I've also written exactly one novel, which is this one that I published. Uh, and it was recognized at National Authors Day last year. Um, and I wrote it in 2012 for NaNoWriMo um, on that particular uh, November. And then it took me four years to get around to editing it and publishing it. And then another like three years to actually start trying to publicize it. So yes, I am the world's worst procrastinator. And that's part of why uh, NaNoWriMo worked for me because I take forever to do anything. And um, it's really hard for me to stick to something. And so having a challenge uh, was really helpful for me. So I thought I would share with everyone sort of some of the things that worked for me and why it did. So. A little bit about NaNoWriMo, for those of you who might not know, it is National Novel Writing Month that happens every November. Um, and the, it's an online challenge to write 50,000 words in 30 days. Uh, so that is about the length of a novel. And so that's what you're going for. They have a website, which I have the link there, um, NaNoWriMo.org, if anyone's interested. It includes an online community. Um, some of the really cool things about it is that it allows you to track your progress. So they have online trackers where you could put in your word count every day. And it's, I don't know, just, there's something almost Pavlovian about being able to see the little tracker go across the screen. Oh yeah, everything's great. I'm making progress. Um, but you also get connected to some really amazing people and uh, you get a lot of encouragement from the way that it's set up. They have authors who give you pep talks and give you some tips and tricks along the way. They've got 
newsletters that go out. Uh, they also do connect you not only with people online and kind of out there in the world, but also with local people too. So you're able to find uh, people who are doing the exact same thing and trying to write a novel in a month. Uh, and you all can share stories. A lot of times people will get together at, of course, probably not this year, um, but in the past, pre-COVID, people could get together at like Starbucks or something and everybody could sit and work. And there's something powerful about being able to have a group of people who you're writing with and creating with. Um, you also, if you win, you get a t-shirt ah! or you get an option to <laughs> buy a t-shirt. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, so that is NaNoWriMo in a nutshell. And I had heard about it for many years. It started in 1999 and I had many friends, family members who would participate in every year. And I always meant to, and I just would never get around to it. Uh, at 2012, that was my year. I was committed and I did it and it, and it happened. So, um, how it worked for me or what I did that made it work for me is really what I'm gonna focus on for the bulk of the presentation today. Um, a lot of planning ahead was really important. Uh, so I started really kind of fleshing out an outline in October. So that was, I had had this idea of a book in my head for a while but I wanted to, I didn't know exactly what was gonna happen, uh, but I knew what the basic theme was gonna be. So I started doing some research on different types of jack tales. Uh, I wanted to find one that would help me tell a specific story. I wanted to tell a love story. Uh, so I was looking for jack tales and love interest and, and cross-referencing a lot of different things um, and found a jack tale called uh, Jack and the Dragoman. And I was like, okay, well, I could do something with this and uh, started outlining characters and doing a rough um, outline of what I wanted the story to, to be. But I didn't go into too much. It was really a rough skeleton. Um, I wanted to know the shape that the novel was gonna take, but I didn't want to try to plan out too much. I wanted to, for there to be room for the novel to still surprise me. And surprise me, it did. Uh, so being able to have just enough to get you started, but not too much to where you feel paralyzed at times uh, really helped me. The other thing was creating and sticking to a schedule um, with kids that was especially important because you get interrupted a lot <laughs> in your life when you've got little ones running around. Um, so what I did was I said, okay, for this month, I'm gonna wake up an hour earlier every single day, and this is gonna be my writing time. Uh, so I did that. I dedicated the first hour of every single day in November to writing. Uh, and I also um, made a space too where I would do it. And uh, you can see that on the screen. I had a little corner of my bedroom that had a writing desk and I would just get myself in that place. And uh, the sun was never up because I was up really early, like four o'clock in the morning early. And so I would have my little lights on and I could watch the sunrise and things start to get a little bit lighter outside. And uh, it was right next to a window. So it was, it was really nice. Um, also making sure that you sort of break it down into daily goals helps it be a little bit less overwhelming. You know, if you think, 50,000 words in a month sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, but, you know, if you do 2,000 words a day, then you've got 60,000 words at the end of 30 days. So you've got a little bit of room, too, if you, like, really freeze up one day, um, you can, you're, you're not, like, completely behind. And so being able to say, okay, this is my goal, sit down, first hour every single day at this space, and I'm going to write 2,000 words. Um, then that really, really helped. Uh, I also kept a tracker. I used the tracker that was on the website so that every day I could put in my little word count and see it move a little bit closer to my final goal. And that helped me. And I also shared that information with my friends and family on, um, on social media so that I had, you know, like 
a small or I say small army of people. That's a little bit of, a, of an over uh, exaggeration, but having people there to support and to give you that encouragement was really helpful as well. Um, and they helped to keep me accountable. And uh, for going on with the space as well, also having the right tools helped me. Uh, what I used was just my iPad and a wireless keyboard. And, um, and I used an app. I used uh, AI Writer. It's a minimalist writing application and it just kind of takes over your whole screen. And all you see is just your text, a white screen and like light gray text. And that's all you have. And that really helped me uh, resist the urge to completely distract myself <laughs> or, you know, oh, what's going on over here? Let me check social media. Let me do this. Let me see what the news is today. Uh, just being able to focus on this is my screen. This is my time. Uh, I'm doing the same thing every single day uh, helped me stick to it. So that was um, a really great app for me to, to be in that space as well. Some other tricks that I used that really helped me was that I did put together, as part of my prepping process, I put together a playlist. So I had uh, very specific characters that were going to have very specific journeys. Uh, and I created songs that made me think of those characters and their story. Uh, it ended up like I don't know, half Latin folk music and half But I'm a Cheerleader soundtrack. <laughs> is uh, I think what ended up happening, but it was still exactly what I needed to get through uh, writing the novel. And another trick, and I know that I learned this from someone or someone shared this with me or I read about it somewhere, was to not finish my last sentence. So at the end of my writing time, uh, I would say, okay, you know, I've got to go get ready for work. I've got to go make breakfast, uh, all of that. I would get to a sentence and I would just write half of it and I would stop. So I would write enough of it so that I knew what I was going to say, but I wouldn't completely finish the sentence. So, you know, Jack is, went to the store where she found and then left it open and knew what I was going to say when I came back. Uh, and so the next day I would start off writing whatever sentence it was that I had left off with. So that way there was none of that staring at your screen, trying to figure out what the next step was. I was able to just go straight into it and I didn't lose my momentum that way. Uh, so that was, I, I wish I could credit, I wish I could credit the person who I got that idea from because it was brilliant and it really helped me a lot. Um, so definitely that makes a big difference. The other thing was just embracing the idea of the shitty first draft. Um, like that Anne Lamont's idea of that is, is so, speaks so well to me. And in this particular situation, um, you know, if you're trying to crank out 50,000 words in a month, it's not gonna be perfect. It's not gonna be polished. It's gonna be really, really messy. And so just knowing that and, you know, not being afraid to just write something ridiculous sometimes and knowing I can come back and change it later was really helpful. Um, November is not the time to edit. It's just the time to get the ideas down on paper. So that was really helpful for me. Um, so those were kind of like the major things that I did that helped me actually complete the novel in November. Um, and if it's all right, I'd like to share with you a few pages from the book so that you can see how it turned out. Uh, so I'll start. I figured I would actually start with the very beginning uh, because beginnings are often the hardest piece of beginning to write whenever you're, uh, when you're like me and you're really uh, nervous about continuing or uh, you're self-sabotaging or, you know, you're, you're just really stuck. Uh, so I'll start at the beginning of chapter one. Jack wasn't sure she knew what she was doing. As the youngest of three children growing up in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, 
she was familiar with this state of being, stumbling through the world, half guessing at life, and hoping she was right at least a fourth of the time. She poked the <laughs> with a stick, her bare feet digging firmly into the red clay of the pond's bank, mud and rock between her toes. Come on now, she said to the turtle, trying to coax it forward. Its jaws snapped angrily at Jack's stick. We can't have you eaten all the catfish. Jack's oldest brother, Will, was working at the glass factory today and wasn't due home for another two hours. Tom was up in the woods, checking the traps he set for the rabbits. It was close to the end of the month, which was always a lean time for the Wilhoits. It was when the bills came due and when Mr. Dragoman collected on the payments for their mother's debts. They were lucky if they could scrape up enough cash, and most months they fell a little short of covering everything. No more trips to the grocery store. If they couldn't grow it, catch it, trap it, or shoot it, they couldn't eat it. At the end of the month, Jack would get into bed at night with an angry, empty belly. Jack poked the turtle in the neck with a stick, and it hissed at her, taking a step forward with a large, slimy foot and sending Jack back a step. Jack was in charge of trying to catch fish from the old pond. She'd noticed it'd become more difficult to get a bite on her lines, and then she spotted the turtle. Honestly, she wasn't sure if the turtle had anything to do with the sudden decline in the catfish population, and she had no idea how to properly dispose of a snapping turtle. Still, Jack was a very great and was sure something would come to her if she just gave it a try. The turtle chomped again, and this time got a mouth full of Jack's stick. It bit down hard, dark, beady eyes fixed on Jack. She felt like it was challenging her to fight to the death, like an old knight in a children's story, or a brave soldier from a forgotten war. She suddenly regretted having bothered this old creature. Why keep torturing it? Let him have all the catfish if he wanted. She bit a large chunk off the end edge of her stick, and Jack took another stick. Easy now, she told her. You know? Gunshot startled her. She dropped the stick immediately, falling back into the room. The green eyes scanned the hill above her, and she saw Tom, the middle brother, with a sweaty red face peering out from beneath the toe up. He lowered the shotgun from her shoulder. Jack's ear was breathing. She looked back to the pond, and she could see the turtle collapse on the shore, half of its shell blown to pieces, its tiny mouth still clinging to Jack's stick. Blood pooled on the clay beneath the animal, trickled into the muddy waters of the pond. What do you do that for, Jack said. She wasn't sure why she was angry. After all, she thought she'd try to beat the turtle to death with her stick when she first found it in the pond, and then she realized very quickly that that was not going to work. Maybe it was because she had been so close to the turtle and Tom wasn't always the greatest shot in the world. Maybe it was because the pond had been her responsibility and she felt like she failed somehow. Maybe because he'd stolen her kill. Tom didn't say anything. He swept up his cap with his left hand, wiping the sweat from his brow, and started walking towards Jack. He had the same frizzy red hair as Jack, but his was cropped short while Jack wore hers and a dozen braids pulled back behind her ears. They both had the Irish freckles and the green eyes from their mother, with the high cheekbones and the large ears they inherited from their grandfather, Jack's namesake, who had passed away a couple of years ago. He had been a kind gentleman who served as steady caretaker for the kids throughout the years as their mother flitted from town to town, but he'd also suffered trauma from his years in the Pacific theater of the war. He bolt up in the middle of the night, sweating, his guns in hand, pacing the floors, trying to hunt his enemies down. Jack was absolutely convinced that one day he might mistake her for one of his enemies. Just one of the reasons why she wasn't particularly fond of guns in general. You could have shot me, Jack complained as Tom walked up to her. He grinned and rubbed the top of her head like he did when she was a kid. Now that she was 17, the jester felt dismissive. Turtle soup, Tom suggested, pointing the barrel of his gun at the mangled snapping turtle. If you can cook it, Jack said, and stuck her tongue out at him. So that's how the book begins. And so I thought I would open it up at this point uh, just for general discussion and any questions that you might have about NaNoWriMo or 
uh, or the book or anything in general. And I can stop sharing my screen now because that's pretty much all I have as far as slides are concerned. Maybe I can stop share. There we go. Technology. <coughs> Yes, Cindy, are you, I think you're on mute. <laughs> so if someone wanted to get more involved with this at the Knoxville level, is there a particular way? Yes, there is a Knoxville um, NaNoWriMo group and they have a Facebook group that I am a member of and I need to, I can uh, share that in the, uh, in the chat actually. Okay. Go find it. Ask. So is it open to all or do you need to be invited or? Uh, it is, it is uh, like you just request to join and I can't imagine that they would uh, say anyone can't be a member of it. Oh, I've been rejected by many people in many groups, so I wouldn't be surprised. But um, I'm curious as to what happened in December. So you've, forgive me, uh, spewed out. 50, 60,000 words, mm -hmm. a shitty first draft as you describe it. Right. So then uh, was December 1st like waking up from a bad date with a really bad hangover? Um, Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that. And uh, remember that I did say that I was the world's worst procrastinator. So I was like, wow, I wrote a novel. Okay, I'll look at that again someday and then promptly forgot about it for like two years. <laughs> Wait a second. So you wrote your first draft and set it aside for two years. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I did. I, um, I think I was a little intimidated by the fact I'd actually finished something and I was uh, terrified to take the next step. So I did have my uh, husband review it and uh, suggest some edits to me. But then I was like, okay, yes, I will get to that and just put it on the shelf. No, I, this is Victoria. I've, I've done NaNo a few times. I have never won, so congratulations. I tend to finish books I've already started during November, but um, <laughs> I can't count all those words. I can only count the ones I wrote in November, but um, there, Stuart, there are some, the, the website, if you sign up on and set up a profile on NaNo and you get the emails, they do um, after November, send emails about editing and all the way up to how to get your book published. So there's support through the website if you, after you're finished in November. Yes. And they are, they are really great about sending out information about editing, about what the next steps are, and also about how to continue to keep that, um, your creativity flowing throughout the rest of the year. Um, which is, you know, very helpful. 2,000 words in a month is quite impressive. Uh, 2,000 words a day is quite impressive. Um, but 50,000 words is really on the low end of what we would call a novel. It might even be considered a novella. And I've often heard it said that it's easier to edit down than up. You'd rather start with 150,000 words and hone it down to 100 rather than having to go in the opposite direction. Was that part of your experience? It ended up being a lot shorter than I expected. I mean, it's still a novel length, but as you can see, it is a very tiny novel. Uh, and I did end up editing it down past the, <laughs> the NaNoWriMo mark for sure. So it is less than 50,000 words in total at this point. Almost there though. Like Which I don't mean to criticize, it's just that I understand that it's a little bit more difficult to get something of that length published. Yes, absolutely. Um, that is one of the challenges. Uh, and the nice thing about NaNoWriMo is that the goal is to get to that, um, to that word count. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have your novel finished it can be a great way to jumpstart and to continue going. For me, that was the story that needed to be told. Uh, I am at uh, the heart of things, a short story writer. That's usually what I write um, because it's hard for me to finish anything that's really long. 
Uh, so I tend to be a short story or essay writer. Uh, but this was the story that needed to be told and it was the right length for it. And it was, um, you know, but there are other stories that might be longer that might take more to, uh, to tell those stories. So um, I'll agree with you on that, Devin. I think a story is as long as the story tells you it should be. Uh, sadly, we live in a world where we have to be pigeonholed and categorized, and that's how we are able to get our work published. So no criticism of writing a shorter, shorter piece, but um, just wanted to bring that up. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting point. You could write the first 50,000 words of a 200,000 word novel if that's what you wanted to do. Right. Yeah, there's actually a category, like you pick the category you're writing in on nano, and one of them is nano rebel, and it's like, I'm gonna write poems all month, or I'm gonna write 16 short stories, or um, actually the guy who is the organizer for nano in Knoxville is working on a comic. So. Did you, um, after you finished the month and the initial draft, did you find any support from within that group as you then later on went to revise? Um, there were definitely offers and I could have turned to them. And I think that if I had taken advantage of the energy, I mean, like if I was gonna say I had a regret, I think that that was one of the things that I didn't do a great job of um, at the end. I was just like, oh my gosh, I did this thing I didn't think I could do and now I'm gonna go sleep for three years. Um, it was, yeah, it was, uh, there, were, there were definitely people there who I could have turned to. Uh, for myself, I just uh, relied on some of my friends uh, for support who were in the writing and editing world. Well, you know, we have writers groups in the guild. Uh, no, actually, this is me being uh, horribly um, naive and ignorant. I, I did not realize that, no. It's a wonderful thing. In fact, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, any of you other guild members, uh, to my mind, that's pretty much the heart of this whole uh, process. Uh, you know, we have little groups of four or five people who get together and share 10, 20 pages a month, whatever it is and critique each other's writing. And that provides an incentive to keep producing. And it also, of course, gives extremely valuable feedback uh, from your peers. And so uh, I would encourage everybody on this uh, call to um, either join or form their own group within the guild and get cracking. Maybe we could do a uh, piano runner group. <laughs> Devin, I was wondering if you could um, speak more about um, procrastination <laughs> because that's my downfall as well. And so how did you keep going when you wanted to switch off and look at something or the house needed cleaning or whatever? Right. Um, definitely making a, like creating a space that did not exist in my life. This help. So like, I, that writing desk, that corner, that morning, you know, that time of day was always times I was asleep and not time I was doing anything else. And so like, it was almost like creating a space where I had to do a thing um, that had not existed there before, prior. And if I had kept the space, I probably would have continued to, uh, to work and uh, create even more things. Uh, but that was really what made the difference for me. If I, I have tried to do that without setting those parameters where um, like other month or other years that I have not done NaNoWriMo and I've tried and I've started uh, where I just like, well, I'll write when I can or I'll write tonight and you know, the kids stay up or the kids wake up in the middle of the night or uh, you know, something comes up at work and then I have to work on that and it's, you know, don't make that space that's like sacred and can't be touched by anything else 
um, and make it different than anything else that's going on in your life, I think it makes it harder, uh, definitely for me. So I would say that forcing yourself to do something completely different is really helpful for procrastination. But it also means you have to procrast fight the procrastination of creating the space <laughs> to not procrastinate. <laughs> This is where I get trapped a lot. <laughs> you plan to do it this year, and um, what are your future plans for writing? That's a great question. I had intended on uh, starting on um, doing a, a sequel to this novel this year. I am not sure if I'm going to be able to do it at this point because I'm homeschooling my youngest children now uh, because of COVID. So if they are still home with me um, and not back in school, I don't know if I'm going to have the time or energy <laughs> to do it. I might, it might be too much of a, of a responsibility this November. But if not this November, the next November, because I hope we will have a vaccine by then. Um, maybe that will help. So. But I do have a, a rough outline. I've done my prep work, so I'm ready. I just need to make myself create that space to go forward. How did you handle the urge to, um, like, how did you overcome the urge to edit and push yourself to move the story forward each day? That was the hardest thing uh, because I would see something and be like, ah, oh, no, I don't like that, or. Um, I mean, I even left misspellings. I, I was just like, I'm going to get everything out right now. Uh, unless it was egregious, I didn't hit backspace. And so that was kind of the way that I got around it, is that as I was writing, if I wanted to um, retool something, I would just try to retool it really fast. And so sometimes there might be a little bit of duplication that I'd have to edit out later. Um, but I wouldn't allow myself to just go back and delete whole sections. I was like, okay, this is, this is what it is. And I'll make a note to myself, you're going to put this in earlier or whatever. And then I will come back to that later uh, to continue on with the, um, with the momentum. That makes sense. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Devin, athletes talk about getting into the zone. And I think that that's something that anybody who's creative, whether an athlete or a writer or a dancer, whoever, um, can identify with. Uh, and it seems to me that perhaps that's what you're talking about when you talk about the creation of a space and a time to do these things. Is, is, is that correct on my part? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, getting in... That's a great point. Getting into the zone is something that I think prior to this experience was almost like a magical thing, you know? Like sometimes it would just happen and I would be there and then I would just, you know, go for it and write whatever I, I needed to write. And um, this was really the first time in my life where I had set the table and <laughs> invited the zone to come in and hoped that they showed up and uh, they did. So that was very, very helpful. Uh, which is not to say that every single day it happened. There were some days that were harder than others, but it was uh, more often than not, I was able to get into that thing online. Uh, and I think that that's a great way to, to put it. And so I think part of it was just having, knowing what had inspired me in the past and trying to kind of recreate that in a quiet space was what helped me get into, into the zone. Absolutely. In terms of preparing, um, preparing for the month, did you do an actual outline of the story? Um, like, is that was that part of it? Sort of building a framework that you would kind of fill in as you move through the days. Uh, it was a very rough outline. It was more my my the thing I focused on mostly was like the characters. So I knew, like, I think I put an outline of what the original jack tail was, because my idea was I wanted to take a traditional jack tail and then modernize it. So I put the outline of the original jack tail. 
uh, as sort of a, you know, um, guidepost or uh, you know, just like a, just a general, this is the direction that we want to go into. Uh, and then I had the characters and the characters I spent a lot of time fleshing out so that I kind of understood where they came from. Um, but that being said, like all kinds of stuff ended up happening <laughs> whenever I was following, you know, my characters around and then other events came up and um, other characters came up and I was like, how did this, this is not even what I was planning on, but I'm going to fall, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to follow it. Uh, so it was not a very uh, detailed, you know, this is what happens in the first chapter. This is what happens in the second chapter. It was more of a, this is the old story. I know I want to rewrite it into a modern retelling. So these are like specific you know, this is the bad guy, this is the conflict, uh, and obviously I want a resolution. And then here are the characters that are gonna play a part in this overall conflict. And then you sort of put them in there and let them kind of follow them on their adventures after that. Uh, so it was, it was preparation and knowing the background, what I was trying to do, but it wasn't like a detailed outline. So in, in that case, was it the characters themselves that sort of drove the story or since you really knew them when you started writing it or did that not really play into it? Yes, definitely. The characters definitely drove the story. Uh, and there were times I was just like, I, this was not what I was planning <laughs> at all. Uh, but it ended up being exactly what needed to be written. So that was really... Oh, that's, that's exciting that that happened. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciated what you, you said earlier, Devin, about having some idea of where you're going, but not determining everything uh, in advance so that it be, then you become you know, a scribe. You're just transcribing whatever it, it was that you thought of earlier. Um, I think that's a great way to get into the zone, uh, but I'm going to have to confess something uh, embarrassing. I don't know what a jack tail is. Oh, okay. Could you, could okay. you explain to that? That is all right. Yeah, no, uh, jacktails are traditional Appalachian folktales. And um, I mean, most of us know some versions of jacktails that came from, you know, England and Europe, like Jack and the Beanstalk and stuff like that. Uh, the Appalachian versions of jacktails usually involve um, a very naive, uh, plucky, boy named Jack who is out to seek his fortune and he's usually got two brothers and uh, he's always getting into trouble but always gets out of it and a lot of them are really funny um, because he's a very you know like he just has a lot of luck and no sense at all <laughs> and, um, and I don't know I just really always was drawn to Jack Tales uh, as I was growing up and I really wanted Jack to be a girl. Like I really thought it would be cool to have um, a character Jack that was not you know, the typical boy going through it. Why couldn't a girl go through the same thing? And so that was sort of my main idea is like, okay, I'm gonna rewrite Jack for a, for a new world <laughs> and uh, let Jack represent other people and so, and then it just turned into this crazy love story. <laughs> that was not exactly what I was planning, uh, but apparently that's what Jack had to say, so. It's a great idea. Um, I'm curious, not having read the book, and I apologize for that. Oh, that's okay. Um, did you ever attempt to explain that Jack was perhaps a diminutive for Jacqueline or Jackie or something like that? Or did you simply put it out there and leave it for the reader to resolve? Uh, I do explain at one point that Jack is named after her grandfather. So the idea is that she is absolutely Jack. So she like goes to the graveyard at some point and she sees her name on the headstone and it's like kind of jarring for her to see her own name, though it's her grandfather who has died. Um, so I explained that she was, for some reason, who knows, 
named directly after her grandfather. But I don't explain why she was named after her grandfather. I, I applaud that. Um, I, for example, I had an aunt named Thomas. Oh, wow. I've never heard of any explanation about that. And that's very, very much perhaps a Southern Gothic sort of thing, a Flannery, Flannery O'Connor thing. Right. So good, good for you for just, uh, just putting it out there and letting people figure it out for themselves. Yeah, I had a, a, a great grandmother who was named Henry. So <laughs> I was also like, apparently that's just what you do. It's just what you do, why not? Um, Devin, um, my life is not as busy as yours is, but it used to be when I was younger. And so I always felt guilty about taking time to do something as, you know, selfish with no money involved as writing. And I wonder if a big value of this is, is the permission and that it announces to everyone, this is it. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think to your point, I think that that was part of why this framework or this challenge worked for me to use at, because it was like, oh, I have this project or this goal that I have to do. Uh, so that helped trick me <laughs> from feeling so guilty about making that time and taking it away from other parts of my life. Uh, because I was like, oh, wait, no, this is the thing. But to your point, it is important to, to make that time for ourselves. And, you know, I think that for me, um, another one of the things that I learned from this process was that it wasn't so much about, like, it was great to have a finished product and it's wonderful to have a novel, uh, but it was so much about the process and, like, making time to actually write and get to know these characters and have fun with this world. Um, and that was something that I did not give myself permission for. Um, and so this allowed me to feel like it was okay to do that. Um, and so now I just got to convince myself that it's okay to do that when it's not November. <laughs> Anybody else? I don't have a question, but uh, I would like to applaud Devin for making the time and making the space and losing her sleep for a whole month. Uh, I know how hard that is. Like Cindy, I'm not, I don't have kids, small kids in the house, but I started writing when my kids were small and that's why I wrote poetry first. It was short. <laughs> so I, I know how difficult that is to be that selfish person and say, okay, I have to get this done. And it doesn't make you friends, doesn't make your family happy, but I, I, I think it's harder for women to, to make that space. But I, I think I applaud you for doing that. And I I'm hope that that will be an inspiration to other women in that circumstance to say, hey, if she can do it, I can do it. So uh, thanks for, for letting us hear that story. On a practical note, I understand that you can get a lot of money for selling small children. <laughs> And then you get two, two things. You get money and you get time. There's no, it's the warranty, Stuart. They come back with the warranty on you. Every oh, is that what it is? It's a damn yeah. shame. Oh, I have can you talk a bit about... Can you talk about getting published and what that part of the process was like? Sure, I can. Um, for me, I sort of fell into it um, because I did have friends who were in the publishing business. And so I sort of had a an in with, uh, with the no cube press publishing company. Um, so that worked out in my favor. They had put a call for manuscripts out and, uh, I was like, okay, yes, please this one. Um, but uh, you know, I knew the people involved, so I'm sure that that helped in that case. Um, so I have, you know, tried to submit other things, short stories, 
Um, I've also, you know, just tried to submit, I guess po some poetry I had some chapbooks that I tried to submit before. Uh, I do have a book of short stories that I've tried to submit, but those, you know, I believe Stuart will probably uh, be on my side on this. Poetry and stories are really hard to get published. Uh, so, but this is, yeah. But that was sort of how that happened for me. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Okay. So I really appreciate you taking, letting me be here and talk to you about my experience. It's been really lovely to be here. It was Thank encouraging. You. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. This is inspiring. Yeah. 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 It was a great, really great pleasure, Devin. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Goodbye then. <laughs> <laughs>